I love the water. I love pretty much every body of water, whether it's a little creek, a nice river, a stream, a lake, or the ocean. I love the water. And I especially love when it is a big enough body of water that I can actually be on a vessel on the water. And I've had the opportunity to do that with a lot of different types of vessels. Everything from a canoe to a kayak to motor boats to a sailing boat um, to an inner tube with a piece of plywood strapped to the bottom of it that I went down the rapids in. Uh, lots of different wonderful experiences, some of them more exciting than others, um, with being on the water. My wife, Loretta, feels the same way. She loves the water. I don't know if she's ever done some of the crazy things I've done, but she loves the water. And a couple of years ago, when they were handing out stimulus checks to everybody, our whole family pooled their money and we bought a pontoon boat. And that's been a lot of fun. And we enjoy being out on the lake with that. We're right here in the Finger Lakes on Lake Owasco. And sometimes we enjoy taking a cruise, but most often we just drop anchor and enjoy being in one spot to swim. Um, if it's warm enough for me, her pretty much any time, the kids pretty much any time, and to just look at the water and enjoy it. Now, we learned a lot about what it takes to stay in one spot when we first got this boat. Because if you want to stay in one spot, you need one of these. It, hopefully it'll be a little bit bigger than this, unless you're Ant-Man and you're just going to be in a toy boat in your bathtub. Um, you're going to need a bigger anchor than this, but it takes an anchor to stay fixed, to stay in one spot. And There's different types of anchors, there's different sizes of anchors, and I did a lot of research into all of that. But most importantly, there's a real skill to setting the anchor, to setting that anchor. I'd like you to look at Hebrews chapter 6. You know, sometimes on the water, I like to just drift along, even in my kayak, to just literally put up my feet and just drift along in that lake. And drifting along on a lake or even in a quiet river may be a pleasant thing to do, but you may not want to just drift along in life. That may not be such a good idea to just go through life being carried by the current. And if that current gets strong, then you quickly find out that you have no control with where you're going. And you're just being carried away by that current. And the currents of life will do that to you. The currents of life will carry you along if you're not anchored. We have an anchor, and it speaks about this anchor in Hebrews chapter 6. Which hope, verse 19, Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have has an anchor of the soul. An anchor of the soul. The hope is the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. The hope is the anchor of our souls, your soul life, your whole life. It's what keeps you from just being carried along. It's what keeps you from being blown about by every wind of doctrine. It's what keeps you fixed and able to withstand whatever comes along. In life, <clears throat> there's so many things that will carry us along. And the storms of life and the winds of life cause it to be very difficult at times for you to stay 
just fixed. Mm -hmm. To stay fixed on God's word. To keep your head and your heart where it needs to be. To not be distracted. To not be just carried away by the newest fad. Or to not be affected by all the different things that come along. If you're going to do that, you have to set your anchor. We've got a really big anchor, you know. Our hope is not a little anchor. This reminds me of the hope. But our hope is a big anchor. It's bigger than the biggest anchor for the biggest ship. And we all have that same anchor because we all have that same hope. But how well that anchor, that hope, keeps us fixed, how well it keeps us able to withstand all the storms of life is dependent upon how well we set that anchor in our minds. We have to set the anchor of the hope in our hearts. We have to set it hard. Where you really make sure that it's dug in, it's dug in and it's taken a firm hold. It's taken a firm grasp. That takes an effort. It takes you doing the work to make sure that that happens. And if you do, then no matter what comes up, you can handle it. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is a great chapter that shows us the benefit, the effect of that anchor of the hope in our life. And we be begin in verse 1, where it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace, Peace with God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's all about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Because of him, we're justified. Because of him, we have peace with God. Because of him, we have access into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in grace, in God's divine favor to us. God's divine favor. Which means that we can expect God to bless us, that you're one of God's favorites. You know, somebody says to you, why does everything go so good for you? I'm one of God's favorites. <laughs> and you can be too. <laughs> it's that easy. Because it's by what Jesus Christ did and it's available for everybody. And because of that, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know what it is to rejoice? It's to take joy a second time. But think about that. What does that really mean, practically? It means you just continue to take joy in the same thing over and over again. You know, those of us that are parents, most of us anyway, can say that we rejoice in our children. That it wasn't just like, there's your baby, and you go, oh, that's great. What a joy. What a joy. And you do that, but it's not like, you know, a year later, you're like, eh, you know, that's old news. I, I, that doesn't do anything for me anymore. I don't take any joy in that child. No. You have that child, and boy, you just take joy in them over and over again. You know, I did that when my children were growing up, still do that they're grown up. And now with my grandchildren. And when they're here, which is often, I get to rejoice in them over and over and over again. We rejoice in the hope. It's not just you learn about it once and you rejoice in it. But every time you think about it, it brings joy to you. It brings joy to you. Boy, I want things that bring joy to my life, don't you? Yes. There's a lot of stuff that I can't control that doesn't want to bring joy to me. I want that which brings joy to me. And the hope 
is one of the greatest and one of the most important ways that we get that. In fact, if we're going to handle all the other stuff that we don't want coming to us, we have to have that hope. And because of it, verse 3 is true. And not only so, not only do we rejoice and hope in the glory of God, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. We glory in tribulations. Boy, don't you glory in tribulations? <laughs> Every time you go to fill up your gas tank and you see the gas is twice as much as it once was, you know, a short time ago, don't you say, hot dog, I am so happy. The prices just keep climbing. Not only the gas, but when I go to buy my food, it's gotten some of it twice as much as it used to be. That is so wonderful. I just, I just rejoice and boast in that. It's so terrific that I have that kind of pressure. And boy, I went to the doctor the other day and he said, boy, you got some things you better think. And that was so great to hear. I just rejoice in that kind of pressure. Isn't that your reaction whenever you hear that you've got some? So, how can this be? How can this be that we could rejoice, glory, boast, which is another translation of that word glory, in tribulations? Well, we're going to look at it a little bit. That word tribulations comes from a Greek word, um, just so you can go around bragging that you know Greek. Philipsis, which means, which is translated afflictions, and it means afflictions or pressures. Pressures. Pressures in life. You know, tribulation isn't a word that most of us use all the time. You know, if I say, how are you doing, Teresa? She doesn't usually say, well, I've, I'm going through some tribulations right now. <laughs> but pressure, yeah, that's, that's one we know, right? That's one we recognize stress, pressure, all that stuff in life that we deal with. And there's lots of it. There's lots of it. And you know, here's the thing. The only way to escape that is going to be when Jesus Christ does come back, which is our hope. So the only way that you escape the pressure from ever having pressures is when he comes back and we get out of here. But, the way you handle those pressures that you cannot always stop is by that same hope, by that hope. Look at Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple places where this word tribulation or other ways that it's translated is used. In Matthew 13 and verse 20, it says, But he that received the word into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon, right away, with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, or immediately, he is offended. Here it's talking about the different types of people receiving the word and it compares it to the sower sowing seed on different types of ground and one of the categories is four different types and one of those categories is when the sower sows seed on stony ground and that's those people that when they hear the word initially it's like oh this is great this is exciting this is wonderful but then as soon as a little persecution or tribulation, a little pressure comes along, they're offended. Well, why, why is this happening? Why? This isn't working for me. It might not be true. I'll walk away from it. That's the stony ground. Look at John chapter 16. Jesus Christ talks about tribulation to his, his apostles, his disciples. Right, before, right at the end of his ministry, in verse 33 of John 16, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, 
that in me ye might have what? Peace. Peace. Where is our peace? In him. In him. In him. You know? Peace is not going to be found in the things of the world. In fact, what he tells us in that same verse, in the world ye shall have what? Tribulation. Tribulation. He told us it's going to happen. We shouldn't be surprised when it does. We shouldn't be surprised. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, because Jesus Christ told you it was going <laughs> to. He told you it was going to happen. He told us that in the world we would have pressures. Things would go wrong. Stuff, the polite version, would happen. <laughs> but, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We'll have pressure. But we don't have to be beat by that pressure. We'll have tribulation, but we do not have to be overcome by that tribulation. That's the clear message throughout the Word of God. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Shall that separate us from the love of Christ? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. That's a lot of bad stuff there, isn't it? That's a lot of bad stuff. A lot of bad stuff that we will encounter in this life because this world is run by the adversary. The god of this world is the devil. Satan is the god of this world, and because of that, stuff is going to happen. So, you don't have to really look any farther, and seldom is there any profit in looking any farther as to why this stuff has happened, then we have an adversary. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the life of being a Christian, isn't it? For thy sake, you know, suffering for the Lord here. And for thy sake, we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. We just have to live a, a miserable life. We just have to somehow grit our teeth and bear it and look for the glory days to come. Is that the message? No. no. Nay. Verse 37. Nay. In all these things, in all those things, in tribulation, in distress, in persecutions, in nakedness, in peril, in famine, in sword, in all those things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. More than conquerors. That's what we're called to be. That's what's available because of what Jesus Christ did. Not because you're so strong. Not because you're so clever or smart or anything else but simply because of God's grace and what he did for you in Christ. We are more than conquerors through my ability? No. Through Christ who well in other places it says who strengtheneth me. Here it says through, through him that loved us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are more than conquerors if we don't give in. If we don't give in, if we don't cater. Life is going to knock you down. You know, and like, like the Rocky quote, right? It's not about how hard you can hit, but how hard you can get hit and keep getting up and fighting. That's, that's what we have to do. We have to do. And the way that we have the ability to do that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, and that word affliction is that same word that we've been looking at, tribulation, pressures. Mm -hmm. The same one that sounded so, so bad in some of those places, and here it's called a light affliction. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it doesn't seem to be feel too light when you get it, right? Mm -hmm. When you get some bad news, when, you're, when your car breaks down, but hey, that's okay, because I just got fired, I won't need it anyway. <laughs> when, when that light affliction comes, it doesn't feel usually too light at the moment, 
But it says, it is but for a moment, and it work, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Eternal. We don't look at those things that are seen. The way that you can keep getting up, the way that you can handle that pressure, and boy, that's the challenge. Because when it comes, it just feels so hard. It feels so heavy. It can feel like such a challenge to just get a hold of your mind and not let your emotions carry you away. Like those currents that just want to carry you away. Those currents that are so strong at times that they just want to sweep you away and, and it just feels at times overwhelming. You know, mentioned the, the boat and last year that was a lot of rain and the currents got so strong that Loretta was on the boat and she had just a horrible time trying to get that boat to a safe place to tie it up to be fixed because those currents just were so strong to fight against. Well, we've got this big, big anchor. This big, big anchor that we have to set. We have to set. And when we do, then we can handle it. You don't have to turn there, but the other word in that verse, and back in Romans 5, that was in that same verse, it says, We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. There is a progression in these verses. It's a figure of speech, anadiplosis. Um, and if you don't like Greek, the English version of that figure of speech is called climax. A climax, you know, where something builds toward a climax. And this section in Romans is laid out that way. It is an ascension. It is steps. Each one of these are a step going up. So you start off with the tribulation, and then the next step that you take is patience. But patience means endurance. The word patience in the Greek is hupomone, and that means endurance. It's not patience like we normally think about, but it's that ability to stand when things get tough. It is that ability to stand. To just stand. To make up your mind and refuse to go down that negative road. To make up your mind that nothing is going to shake me. Nothing is going to cause me to, to doubt God. It's like that song, you can't make me doubt him. <laughs> you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. So every time somebody tells me for the umpteenth time in my life that the sky is falling, I'm not shook because you can't make me doubt him. I'm not shook because I know that I have a hope. And because that hope is real, I know that God is real. I know that he handles, he'll take care of whatever comes along. And I just make up my mind to stand. To just stand on the promises. We'll look at a couple places where that word's used. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 is a different gospel, but it's that same parable of the sower that's being referred to. And in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, it talks about the good ground. We looked at that stony ground. Mm -hmm. the, the word never took root. But here's that good ground, verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. They hear the word and they do it. And they bring forth fruit with patience, with patience, with endurance. If you're going to bring forth fruit with that seed, you got to be patient. You got to be patient. You go and sow a beautiful crop in a wonderful field that's been plowed and it's rich with nutrients. It's that good ground that Grace Bliss would have liked. And you can do everything right, 
But you got to be patient to get that harvest. You know, if it comes, if it's around here and you plant it in April, is that when you plant around here? You can tell no. what a farmer I am. No? Right about now. Right about now? Yeah, May. Yeah. May, okay. No wonder I never grew up. <laughs> <laughs> you plant this, this stuff now, and, and come the end of July, you're looking for your corn, and you're looking for your uh, you know, tomatoes. tomatoes and whatever else you planted. Are you going to find it? No. You're not going to find that corn. That one I know. I remember knee high by the 4th of July, so you've still got a ways to go. <laughs> you've got to be patient. You've got to be patient for to receive that crop. We stand. We're patient. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, one of my favorite sections mm -hmm. in the Word of God, and especially in light of this, in Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's referring to the example of the Old Testament believers that believed God, and that's chapter 11. Chapter 11 just names all these great believers of the Old Testament. Abraham and Moses and all these great believers and how they believed and received the promises. Since we're compassed about with those examples, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. It's so easily to get weighed down. It's so easy to get burdened down. It's so easy to get off the word, to miss the mark, to lose that focus, to lose that endurance. Let us lay those things aside and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There's that word. Run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, I've never done a marathon run. The farthest I ever went was 10 miles. Um, but that took a little um, running with patience, you know. You, you have to be prepared for that long run. When I, we, I did this when I was in this program called the Way Corps, and, and it was a whole group of us that were doing it. And we, somebody made the mistake of playing the Rocky theme as we set off on our run. Now, that would be a good one to come back to, but... If you're playing that, I don't know about you, but I've never heard that song played that I didn't like, boom, take off like a rocket, you know. Even a few years ago when I was, got, I was being a little more faithful in a little better shape, I got myself to the point that I had this playlist and I'd hear that song and I still would run. As fast as I could, was admittedly, wasn't quite as fast as once. But you're not going to do that and do 10 miles. You're not going to run as fast as you can and do 10 miles. You got to recognize that you got to pace yourself. It takes patience. And this race that we are in is one that requires patience. Verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I don't care what you think you're putting up with. It doesn't compare with what he had to endure. None of us will do that. None of us would do that, but we follow his example. We follow that example, and doing it, we can endure what we have to endure. And we'll learn more about this, but first we'll take a quick break. <laughs> so, <clears throat> tribulation, those pressures that come up in life, those work patience, endurance. It puts you in a situation where you've got to make a decision. Do I cave? Am I beaten by this pressure? Do I allow myself to just be swept away by it, overcome by it, or am I going to stand? 
And then when you stand, the next verse in Romans 5, in verse 4, Romans 5, 4 says, and patience, experience. And there's a, an ellipsis there. It's patience worketh. Experience is the understanding. That patience then brings about experience. And here again, let's look at what that word means to understand better this progression, these steps, the steps that are leading up. That word experience comes from the Greek word dakame, dakami, which is proof. It means proof. You can turn to Philippians chapter 2 and you see this word in another context. Experience or proof. When we stand, we have the proof. Philippians 2 verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus un shortly unto you, that you also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that has a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. They were acquainted with Timothy. They knew Timothy. He was sending Timothy to them. And he was doing that because they knew that this was somebody they could trust. Timothy had proven that he was like-minded with Paul, that he had stood with him in some tough times. They went through a lot of tough times. They went through some real persecutions and tribulations. And Timothy didn't back down. He didn't cater. He stood. And that proved his trustworthiness to the Philippians. When we stand on God's word, when we're patient, we prove that the word works. When you decide to claim the promise, to stand on that promise, then you prove the word in your life. You try it out and you prove it. Yeah. Being a believer doesn't mean we take things by, quote, blind faith. Mm -hmm. We prove God's word by walking out on it, by claiming the promise, by standing on the promises. Then we prove that God's word works. Think about the nation of Israel and all the times that they had the opportunity to make that decision. Where they were faced with some tribulations. They got out in that desert and there was no water. And that was certainly, when you need water. You can't go too long without water, especially in the desert. And that was a time of proving. Now, they didn't prove God's word. It was only God's grace that put up with them time and time again. But, nonetheless, when we face those challenges and stand, we prove God in our life. Going back to Romans again. The next part of that verse, Romans 5, 4. And patience, experience, and experience, here's the next step, hope. Hope. It begins and ends with hope. This progression in our life of how we handle the bad things that come up, it begins and ends with hope. It's bookended that way. Because of the hope, because of the hope, we don't just get, give in. When we're faced with those pressures, we stand. And when we stand, we prove the word. And when we prove the word, when we prove the word works, you know what else we prove to ourselves? That he's coming back. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a whole wonderful chapter on that in 1 Corinthians 15 about the hope that we won't have time to go into today. Nor will we, for, I don't believe, get to 1 Thessalonians 4, the other great chapter. But today we're focusing on the effect of that hope, that hope of his return. And that hope that we have 
causes us to be able to stand in those pressures. But in that section in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if in this life only we have hope, then we are of, most, of all men most miserable because we believed a lie. If he's not coming back, then we just believed a lie and we ought to be felt sorry for him. If you lived your whole life to serve him and in the end he's not coming back, then, boy, we got a reason to cry in our beer. We got a reason to feel sorry for ourselves. But we know that's not the case because we prove God's word in our life. Every time you stand and claim the promise, it just cements that, boy, this stuff is real. He is coming back. That hope is a reality. And it's just this wonderful, virtuous cycle in our lives. You start with that hope. You stand during those pressures. You prove God's word in your life, and that gives you even more strength to look for the hope and believe in the hope, which gives you more ability to stand. Mm -hmm. Look at Philippians chapter 2. No, we did that one. Look at Romans chapter 4. <laughs> chapter 8, rather. You know, the hope is that assuredness. It's that full, confident expectation of what is going to happen. You know, it's, it's not that way that people use hope today. Today, it's a very wishy-washy word, I hope. You know, I was supposed to have a picnic... The weatherman says there's a 95% chance of rain. The sky's got filled with black clouds. I sure hope it doesn't rain, though. <laughs> Why, are you fully expecting it won't? <laughs> of course not. That's the way people hope, you know. Well, I, you know, I, I hope I get that job, you know. I'm not at all qualified for it, and I blew the interview, but I, I hope I get it. Well, that's not the way that hope is used biblically. Hope is something that we have a full expectation, but it's not yet available. The first place it's used in the Bible is when Ruth talks to Ruth and, no, Naomi. Ruth wasn't talking to herself. She might have, but that's not what I was referring to. <laughs> Naomi talks to her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. Um, not, not Oprah. She wasn't one of them. Orpah. And they say they want to go with her back to her land. And she says, you know, well, boy, what can I do for you? I, you know, if I would say that I had hope that I could have sons, would you wait along for them to be grown up and marry you to help you out? You know, because she was in a situation in that culture where a woman needed a man to, to kind of do anything. Um, but... That hope was referring to the expectation of the child to be born. When, when a woman's pregnant, she fully expects that this is going to end up with the birth of a child. That's the expectation. But when she's one month pregnant, can she believe for that to, to child to be born yet? No. She's got to wait. She has to wait for it. She anticipates it. She joyfully looks forward to it. Maybe a little less joyfully as it goes along and she's getting tired of, when is this kid ever going to come? I've been pregnant now for two years. Um, that's how she feels. But boy, she fully expects it. Our hope is one of expecting he's coming back. In Romans chapter 8, verse 24, we see this defined here in verse 24. For, for we are saved by, should be to, hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The things that we can believe for, we believe for. Those things that can come about, we don't hope, we believe. And people that are hoping for that which they should be believing for are never going to get what they should be believing for. If you are hoping for that job, then you need to believe for that job. If you're 
hoping that something good's going to happen. It won't happen until you get to the point of actually believing and not just being a hoper in that category. There's the difference. The things that we can believe for, we believe for. But the hope is not something we can believe for, but with patience we wait for. But it's an act of waiting. It's not a waiting like, you know, well, I'll just sit here fishing until he comes back. That's not the expectation. That's not that waiting. It's like when you're waiting for that, that special guest. Somebody, some family member that you haven't seen for a long time. You know, my daughter Lindsay lives in Georgia. And she's going to be coming up this summer. And we're looking forward to that. And as it gets closer, we'll do more and more to get ready for it. You know, there's, there's making up the, the bed in the guest room. There's preparing meals and planning meals and all this stuff that my wife does. <laughs> <laughs> She's that active. <laughs> she has that active expectation. I, I just kind of check the calendar now and then. <laughs> but I'm, I've got the same excitement in my heart. With Christ coming, it's not just that excitement in the heart, but it's all that doing. It's that living in light of the hope. Living in light of it. You know, Jesus Christ talks in the gospel, not specifically our part of the hope, more Israel's part of the hope, and I won't try to explain all that right now. The hope involves more than just the gathering together. It also involves, after that, the resurrections. And Jesus Christ talks about that. And he talks about, in light of that, that if those servants were waiting for that master, they would do all the things to prepare for him. They wouldn't be found sleeping when he gets there. They'd be doing the things that were preparing for him. And that's, and that's true for us as well. We don't want to be not living for God when Jesus Christ returns, do we? No. You know, you don't want to just, you know, that day where you gave in to the pressure and you're feeling miserable and you're like, oh, why isn't God taking care of it? And then there's the trumpet and it's like, oh my gosh, I feel like such a schmuck. <laughs> You know, here he is coming back, and, 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 you know, I was like so out of fellowship. I was so negative. I was so teed off. <laughs> no, we want to be, at that time, just expecting him, living for him. <laughs> when we have that hope, we can live on that higher plane. Look at Colossians chapter 3. That whole progression that begins in hope and ends in hope is that decision to live life on a higher plane. To not just be bogged down. To not just be carried away. But instead that, boy, we've got our anchor just set. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead or complete, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's the hope. He's coming back. And when he appears, we will be with him in glory. And because of that, we set our affection, our thoughts, our heart on the things above. Not on the stuff here. That's not where we set our hearts. Boy, if your heart is set on the things above, if you are looking at the things that are not seen, then whatever comes up in life it will not shake you to the very core. And things in life can do that. But you can never lose the most important things. You're never going to lose your eternal life. You're never going to lose your sonship rights. You're never going to lose your inheritance in heaven. I can lose everything I own here, 
But boy, if my heart is set on the inheritance I have in heaven, then I'm not going to get shook by everything I lose. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Not a verse that specifically talks about the hope, but one that does certainly talk about where our affections, our hearts are set. And again, if we're looking at those things that are not seen, if we're looking at the eternal weight of glory instead of the light affliction, then we can have our hearts in the right place. In Matthew 6, verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Treasures means your affections, your heart. That's what the treasures are, the things that most matter. Don't have those set on the things on earth where it's, an, it's a, a whole Eastern idiom. But moth and rust represent doubts and worries. Where doubts and worries just chip away. They just chip away. And that's what happens in life. Those doubts and those worries, they just wear away at you. And thieves break through and steal represents fear. And fear will steal everything out of your life if you let it. It's what happened to Job. It was fear that caused him to lose everything. The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. That's what Job's problem was. And that can happen if our hearts are on the things on earth. Verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Put your affection there, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasures, where your affections is, there will your heart be also. Where you've set your thoughts, where you've set those affections, that's where your heart's going to be. If your heart's in the things on this earth, if your heart's in the, all the stuff, well then, that's what's going to be important to you. But that can be stolen. Verse 22, the light of the body, the light of the body, the light of life, is the eye which represents your spiritual understanding. If therefore thy eye or spiritual understanding be single or perfect, thy whole body is full of light. But if thine eye, your spiritual understanding, be evil or erroneous, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Man, what a statement for our time. If the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If that place where you think you're doing the right thing, where you think that you're never, you know, it's hard enough, you know, when you know the darkness in your life that's still there. But when you think there's light in an area and that turns out to be darkness, how great is that darkness? That's why the spiritual understanding has to be single. It has to be right. You have to know the truth. You know, if you believe a lie, if you believe a lie, and boy, when it comes to this category of the hope, people sure do believe some lies. You know, they sure do. And I won't go into the, that area of it because I don't have the time to really handle that right. But boy, there's a lot of lies when it comes to the hope. People have been taught wrongly. Things that people have been taught and ultimately, as nice as it might sound at that one moment, it can set a person up for all kinds of spiritual consequences in their life. Mm -hmm. If the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24. No man can serve two masters. I'll resist. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. If you've ever been in a job where you had answered two bosses, you know how impractical that is. <laughs> you gotta, this guy tells you to do that, that fellow tells you to do that, you're going to have to listen to one of them, and you're only going to make the other guy mad. Here, you've got to choose what master you're going to serve. You cannot serve God and mammon, or worldly things. 
you got to serve somebody. Even Bob Dylan knew that once. <laughs> You've got to decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or the things of this world? Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought, no anxious thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Don't get shook about all these things. You know, how am I going to afford this? Everything's going up except my wages. <laughs> Take no thought. Don't get worried about it. Don't get worried about all these things. But if your heart, if your affection is based on this world, on the five senses stuff, then you can't help it. If the evidence of the five senses is what really weighs most for you, then you can't help it. If you think you've got to figure it all out, then you can't help it. Then you can't help but have that doubt, that worry, that fear. Then you can't help but have anxious thought. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment, it goes on to say? Isn't there more than life than just getting by? Well, I'll tell you what, when I was a very, very young man, I decided real quick that if there wasn't, then I really didn't care. <laughs> if there's not more to life than just making a living, if there's not more than life than just scratching out a living, just existing, if I'm no better off than the animal that has to spend his whole day figuring out how to get his next meal, then let the chips fall where they will. I couldn't care less. There's got to be something bigger. There's got to be something greater. And there is. There is. Mm -hmm. Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air. Look at the birds. For they sow not, neither do they reap. How hard are they working? You ever see that bird on, on the little John Deere tractor plowing up the field? <laughs> Scattering the seed? You ever see that? No. Me either. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. God somehow takes care of them. Are you not much better than they? I don't care how low an opinion you think you have of yourself. Do you really think you're lower than that pigeon that does nothing but crap on a statue? <laughs> and yet somehow God takes care of them. God, will, he, he cares about us. He will not let us down. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Who can make yourself any taller? <laughs> I would have if I could have. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little what? Faith. Faith or believing. If God can take care of the birds, if he can take care of the beautiful flowers in the field that are just here and then gone, won't he take care of us, his yes. children that he loves so dearly? Yes. Boy, that's what we have to keep in our minds. We have to keep our eyes on Him. We have to keep our eyes on that hope. Have to recognize that we have this wonderful life that God's called us to. Verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Those Gentiles. You don't want to be like those Gentiles, do you? <laughs> you could substitute in our culture unbelievers, you know. That's, let, you know, let the unbelievers worry about that stuff. Let the unbelievers try to figure it out. Let them deal with it. We'll just trust God. We'll just trust God. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He knows. He knows. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's the simplicity of life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will take care of you. Trust him. Trust him. Stand on the promises. Prove God's word in your life. 
Verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, live one day at a time. Live one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. When you get to tomorrow, you know what? If you're trusting God, you'll find that all this stuff that you wasted your time worrying about, you didn't have to. <laughs> and no matter what's going on, once he returns, none of it matters. We have the final victory. If you lose at everything else in life, you still win in the end. That's the great thing about the game we're playing. You can afford to lose every hand and still win in the end. You can lose every inning and yet still win the ball game because we are promised that final victory. We're promised that final victory. Keep that in your mind. Keep, let that settle your heart. Let that keep your soul anchored. Look at Colossians chapter 1. We'll close here in Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since, the day, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before, the wor before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world? He thanked God for them since the day that they heard of that hope. That hope that they heard about, that hope that was preached throughout the world. That's our hope. And it goes on to say in that verse, <laughs> And at verse 6, And bringeth forth fruit, has it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. The hope brings fruit in our lives. When we wait with patience for that hope, we have the fruit in our lives. The fruit of God's word. You know, standing on the promises takes some work. It takes some effort. You don't want that effort to be in vain. You don't want to put forth all that effort and then not be patient to receive. That hope produces fruit. When we have the patience of the hope, that anchor, then we see the fruit in our lives. God bless you.